Welcome to Inside the Indians, your source for insider information on the tribe. Stay with us as we bring you the latest about the players, managers, and people behind the scenes at Victory Field. Now here's your host, the longtime broadcast voice of the Indians, Howard Kelman. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Inside the Indians. Our guest on today's show, Indians pitching coach Dan Meyer. We'll be back with Dan after these words. Indianapolis Indians pitching coach Dan Meyer, our guest this week on Inside the Indians. Dan, how are you doing? How are things going? I'm uh, I'm doing all right, Howard. We're uh, we're here in Des Moines and um, trying to finish the second half of the series off uh, strong. So we're getting there. When you look at the season to this point, give us your overall impressions of the pitching staff. Um. I thought they've done a good job. I mean, we've had some adversity. Uh, we've had, um, you know, we've had some guys that are young uh, that have really developed well and and helped the big league team. And we have some guys that, you know, have come down here, have, um, you know, put their ego in their back pocket and have worked and have gotten back there to help the big league team. So I think overall um, these guys are, you know, doing well and, and battling adversity and making adjustments like you need to. Talk about the adjustments. Tell us what you mean when you talk about adjustments. Um, it could be anything from mechanical adjustments that they were struggling with in the big leagues to, you know, making a pitch adjustment. If you know, say they want guys to throw more changeups to right-handed hitters, or uh, work on getting slider in the zone more, um, or fastballs up, or you know, anything of those such things that they need to do to get better in order to get back to the big leagues and to help the team win. When you go out to the mound to talk to a pitcher, and I say you, it could be any pitching coach, tell us some of the things you might say to a pitcher when he's in trouble and you go out there. Uh, I mean, it could be anything, really, depending on the moment. Um, it could be anything from trying to calm them down to giving some type of scouting report just to give them some type of, you know, idea or get their mind off the inning. Um, excuse me. It could be anything. If I think they're uptight and they're struggling, it could be something funny or a joke or uh, maybe something in, in our relationship that we've developed as something funny, um, an inside joke or something. I mean, it could be anything depending on the situation. I don't, I don't think there's anything off limits out there on that, on that Island. Don't you think it's so important to go out there at the right time before the major damage is done, as opposed to walking out there after a three-run double? Um, what I'll in my situations, it's a little different than necessarily or the minor league situation than maybe um, in a big league situation. On the minor league side, there are times where I might not go out and take a visit. Um, just to see how they would react or see if they can get through it or, you know, as a development phase. But I mean, most of the time you're going to try and catch that um, big inning out early. So you can kind of limit it. Yeah. Uh, it's so important. I've often felt that that's one of the big jobs of a pitching coach is to go out there at that right moment at that right time and say the right thing and that can turn somebody's around. The game the other night in Des Moines, you went out there at the right moment when a guy was in trouble, and boom, he turned it around completely. Yeah, I mean, you're just trying to um, use, like, you know, in-game feel. It's, you know, it, you got to treat it each pitcher differently. You got to know who can handle what. So if you can get out there at the right time and, and you know, do – you don't want to do too much, but maybe say the right thing or help him a certain way, maybe lead him. You know, that three-run inning might turn into a one-run inning, or you maybe get out of it early. And that can be the difference between a win and a loss or, you know, six innings or three innings. So, um, you know, it's it's pretty vital. What are your thoughts when you look back to your playing career? On, on what exactly? Just your overall feelings. You look back at your career, what you accomplished. You did get to the big legs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I think everybody wants their career to be, you know, better. I think it, it, you, 
in our sport, in our uh, industry, we're all competitors. That's how you get here. You want to be the best. Um, I had a good career. I can't complain. Um, it wasn't, you know, what you, every child wanted. Some injuries in there and some some frustration, some struggles. But, uh, you know, being 42 and the person I am now, um, you use those experiences to shape where you're at now. And I think um, 10 years ago, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? 10 years ago, I would have, you know, looked at it a different lens than I am now. Now I use all my failures that you were, my learning experiences to help uh, the kids I'm coaching now or the, the young men I'm coaching now. So they don't, so if I can help them in something in their career that I had to go through and they get through it, then um, that's my job now. So um, I look at it as more of a learning experience for what I'm doing now. I think that's a good way of putting it. Although let's go back one more time. Tell us a highlight or two that stands out from your career. As we said, you did get some time in the big leagues. Yeah, I mean, just I guess my highlight would be, I mean, one of, of many, but um, <laughs> I don't know what I can tell exactly. Um, I guess kind of a funny story I would tell is um, we, my second road trip in the big leagues in September of 04, I want to say we went to uh, Wrigley Field. Um, and if anybody's been to Wrigley Field, obviously it's, it's very, it's got a lot of history to it. And, um, you got to walk, the clubhouse is actually above the main concourse. You have to walk this, like this, I don't know what you call it, a metal walkway, if you will. It's covered. You can't see it. You can actually look out and look down on the people walking. Well, anyway, you walk down in the bath, you walk down to the dugout and there's a, just a urinal there. And, um, Bobby Cox is like, enjoy it, man. And I'm like, what? And he's like, all the greats have peed here. Babe Ruth, they've all done it. <laughs> you're just, you're in the mix. And it's just kind of funny to like, kind of help you relax. Like, you know, just kind of, that's what, you know, Bobby was good at that stuff. Just kind of made you feel at home. And that was, it kind of hits you there. It was like, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, Bobby's one of the all time great managers, Bobby Cox, Atlanta Brave Hall of Fame manager. And he mentioned something there. And when I asked players about the best manager they ever played for, or why do they like somebody so much? They say calming effect. And that's an example of that right there. Yeah, Bobby just had this thing about him that um, it was just so personal. I mean, he didn't forget your first name. Um, you know, I pitched for him for three weeks in September as a young guy. I mean, he's been around forever. Um, and years later, I would see him and he would say hello, say my first name, shake my hand, like um, just the personality, that the letting you know you cared. Um, you know, that stuff really matters when you're trying to help guys, you know, these men make decisions that involve and affect their lives. We'll have more with Indians pitching coach Dan Meyer after these words. Dan Meyer, the Indianapolis Indians pitching coach, our guest on Inside the Indians. Dan, let's talk about pitching for a moment and how it's changed because it has since you were pitching. You mentioned in the last segment going to the big leagues in 04 with Atlanta. Let's talk about that and let's get your thoughts on the emphasis now on velocity. All right, where do you want me to start, Howard? Well, give us your thoughts on the way pitching has changed and how you feel. Um, yeah, I mean, pitching's changed. I mean, it's changed in my time, it's changed, I mean, three or four folds. Um, you know, the game was. Um, velocity and pitching up in the zone um, and, you know, more of sweeping sliders um, with the ABS and they're trying to um, get more interaction and, and more um, play on the field. Um, I think the game slowly is getting back to like sinkers and cutters and um, change ups and the shorter sliders. Um, you're starting to see that now. So, I mean, it goes through trends and I think uh, we're in the middle of, um, we're at the end of the fastballs up and and big sweeping slider trend, and we're more into the you know shorter action type movement stuff down in the zone for ground balls because that's where the game's going. They're trying to um, get more entertainment on the field, ground balls, fly balls, home runs, stolen bases. So um, you know if you're not, it's the adapt to die, right? So it's all we're doing at this point. 
Do you want your pitchers to try to induce weak contact or try to strike people out and miss bats? Um, I don't think you should go for the strikeout to have two strikes. Well, I guess I should rephrase that, really. I mean, if you're a reliever and you're coming in second, third, two outs with a base open, every pitch should be a strikeout pitch. But um, that's a different situation. That's a little more advanced. For me, if I'm telling younger starters or – um, anybody early in the game, like you should be trying to pitch to your strength, um, you know, weaker contact. And then when you get two strikes, um, that's the time you go for the strikeout. But uh, you can't get a strikeout until you get the first two strikes. So I know uh, when you get a first pitch ground ball to shortstop, keeps everybody on his toes. Uh, I understand you like strikeouts and they're needed in certain situations, certainly runner at third, less than two outs, but there's nothing like a first pitch ground ball to short to have all the infielders on their toes and focused. Yeah. I mean, the more, the more balls put in play, um, the more the defense doesn't get kind of staggered. Um, but there's just so many positives to early contact um outs it's you know pitch count so you're talking about health if you're a reliever you're talking about usage um you're talking about efficiency um, there's just so many things that come out of that there's nothing really negative that can come from you know a first pitch crowd ball or or you know a, a, a two pitch or a three pitch out so you know there's there are some guys will preach you know get them on base or get them out in four pitches or less just to kind of help them zone them into the to the, to the strike zone and to the plan Tough for young players, for a hitter to trust his hands, a pitcher to trust his stuff, because guys try to do too much as a natural tendency. Is that something you talk with the pitchers about, to trust your stuff as opposed to overthrowing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, at, at this level, that's something that, uh, you know, can happen for sure. We have a few guys that try and overdo it, and it takes them a while to kind of rein it back in. Um I equate pitching as a, they're very, to me, there are a lot of similarities with pitching and there are golf. Um, and the best way I can put it is um, if you're not feeling fully great about your golf swing and you're just swinging as hard as you can, it's going to spray. But if you get into the rhythm and the tempo of the delivery and, you know, you get some, you get some innings under you and you know, maybe you're on the ninth hole and you're feeling good about your swing, then you can start letting it go. But if you try and start as hard as you can and try and work your way back, um, the feel, the, the be able to zone in the stuff is a lot harder. So same thing for pitching. With the Indianapolis Indians and with other teams in our league, AAA baseball, bullpens are now, you have 10 or 11 relief pitchers now, as opposed to when you were pitching, you might have five or six relief pitchers. What are your thoughts on having so many relief pitchers now? Um. Yeah, I don't really have an opinion either way, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's not a big deal. I mean, it just gives you more options to develop, um, which our ultimate goal, and everybody likes to win and lose and play the game. But, you know, there are times our ultimate goal is to, you know, develop guys, to get them back to Pittsburgh to help win. So, you know, if we have a couple extra arms that we can help save guys some injuries or – you know, a couple extra arms to help us win a ball game in Pittsburgh or even in Indy. Um, I'm never going to be against that for sure. What about the challenges of getting everybody enough work when you have 10 relief pitchers or 11 relief pitchers? I mean, yeah, that's nothing's changed. I mean, it, you know, we have 12 hour days at times working. So, um, you know, yeah, the workload, but I mean, it's a lot harder things you can do in life, right? So, you know, for me to deal with a couple extra, you know, pitchers that um, are trying to get the work in, I think that we can do that. Okay, we'll have one more segment with Dan Meyer. We'll be back with Dan. This is Inside the Indians. Indians pitching coach, our guest on Inside the Indians. Dan, let's look at some of the pitchers. Quinn Priester having a good season here, recently went to the big leagues. Give us your thoughts on Quinn. Yeah, Quinn is um, he's a special talent. Um, Quinn's 
uh, very mature for his age. He's um, advanced as far as his thinking. He's a very smart um, guy when it comes to uh, the pitch metrics and the movement, what he's trying to do. Um, he's been a pleasure to work with. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see um, how he does in the big leagues. He's got a really good curveball. Would you say that's his best pitch? Yeah, I mean, it's up there for sure, depending on the day. Um, you know, he has a couple different weapons, but his curveball is definitely a good one. One of the ways the game has changed in terms of pitching is the fact that, and let's get your thoughts on this, nowadays pitchers throw more breaking pitches, change-ups, more secondary pitches, and they don't throw as many fastballs as they used to throw. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, there's no no argument on that. I just think, um, you know, these game, the game goes through phases, you know, and, and for the longest time, it was, you know, pitch off the fastball, um, you know, establish the fastball. Um, you know, I think they're coming to realize that that's not um, always necessarily the case. Um, now that we're a little more advanced with, with some of the readings and the metrics and stuff that we can get um, on the opposing team. So, um, yeah, while that, that game has changed, um, how can we adjust so that we can avoid, you know, the negative side of that stuff, the injuries, et cetera. So. And talking about Quinn, he throws a fastball that has some sink to it. Tell us his approach with his fastball. Does he also throw a four-seamer, two that might uh, rise a bit or run? No. Um, so Quinn's sinker in uh, his four-seam cuts now. We've, we've turned This year we turned that into a little bit of a cutter. So the four-seam fastball kind of just stayed um, – it was just an okay four-seam fastball with some, some just – um, struggle with uh, some of the command at times. So we kind of altered that into a all set four scene, which ends up cutting. So now it's cutter, sinker, um, slider, change up curveball. And, um, you know, he sinks it to righties to get those early ground balls. Um, normally, typically sinkers to um, opposite handed, you know, righty sinkers to lefties or, or left handed sinker balls to right handed hitters usually don't fare as well because the ball sinks and runs into the bat. So uh, for Quinn, you, you develop a cutter so you can cut it into lefties. Um, so, you know, more sinker to righties, cutter, cut fastball to lefties, um, and then just kind of work off of that. How about Luis Ortiz? He has some good stuff. He has a chance to be a good major league pitcher, too. Give us your thoughts on him. Yeah, Luis is um, a special talent as well. Um, he's got, a, an, you know, a really good arm. Um, just like any player, you're going to have frustration. You're going to have. Um, struggles at the highest level um and you know he ascended to this top really quick last year um basically come from a ball and ended in the big leagues um, you know just going through some mechanical stuff with him and trying to tighten up um a few movement things with his fastball um but he's got really good stuff and you know as soon as he can you know as soon as we excuse me as soon as we can put that all together and get him back on track and get him some confidence um you know he's gonna be really good to me, one guy who is extremely impressive and is young, only 20 years, 21 years old, is Jared Jones. I'd like to get your impressions of Jared. Yeah, Jared's um, he's another really good arm. Um, you know, he's quiet, but, um, you know, he pitches a little chip on his shoulder. Um, he throws really hard. He's got really good stuff. I mean, I've had him limited here now at two or three starts, I think. But, um, you know, it's it's been really good. He's pitched well in, in some tough spots. So, uh, you know, he's going to be fun to watch and uh, he's fun to work with. Some guys get into a jam and they let things snowball on them. Jared Jones seems like a really good competitor that when he gets into a jam, he's going to try to battle his way out of it and give it everything he has. Yeah, of course. I mean, he's definitely a fighter. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's where we go back to um, – learning to compete in a battle, but not trying to do more than, or trying to do too much or trying to overthrow. Um, and not saying he does, but that's just kind of common. 21 years old, um, he's got so much talent, you know, it's, now it's just the experience. I mean, he's facing guys that are 10 years older than him in this league. They have, um, have had so many at bats that, you know, they're able to work th different things. So just learning that facing those experienced guys, what they're trying to do to them. Um, you know, this is where, as a 21 year old, like I said, you just, you learn through um, experience and in-game stuff. 
I think that's really well said. Two guys who've done pretty well out of the bullpen, Colin Selby and Cody Bolton. Your impressions on them? Yeah, both were hard workers. Both got really good stuff. Um, you know, I had Bolton last year. Um, he continues to get better and to work. Um, Selby this year has been, you know, as of, you know, he's got really good stuff as well. As of late, it's been been lights out. So it's been fun to work with both those guys. Um, you know, a lot easier to give those guys the ball late in the game when they're throwing the throwing the ball well. So, um, you know, it's 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 just fun to be a part of. Those guys are uh, they got really good stuff. Dan, thank you so much for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you when the Indians get back home, and look forward to talking to you later during the season. Thanks again. You got it. Thanks, Alan. That's Dan Meyer, and this is Inside the Indians. thank our guest Dan Meyer the pitching coach of the Indianapolis Indians in his second year we'll see you next week on Inside the Indians